Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning that we have the honor of being in your presence, God, being in your house. Lord God, we know that you're here among us. Lord, that when we gather, Lord God, and we come in your name, Lord, that we don't have to beg, we don't have to wonder, Lord, but we know that you are here among us. And when you are here, God, Lord, burdens can be lifted. God, chains can be broken. Lord God, despair can lift, Lord God, in your presence. And so we just ask this morning that you would do in us, Lord God, what is needed most in our hearts. God, that you would do it in us individually. You would do it in us, Lord, as a collection of your body, a community of faith. Lord, that your name would be exalted, Lord Jesus. And only those things, Lord God, that bring glory and honor to you, Lord God, would abide and remain in this place. And we just give you thanks and glory and honor for what we know you are already here to do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody that's in agreement with that prayer, say amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord one more. Applause and praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Come on, point at somebody and let them know, I'm glad you came. Amen. I'm glad you came. Glad you came. Amen. Hallelujah. Glad you came, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, praise God. It is good to gather today in the presence of the Lord with one another. Amen? Amen. There's, there's, just, there's just a natural order uh, to life and the spirit that uh, when, we, when we get filled up, we're not just filled up to stay filled up. We're filled in order to what? Pour out. Isn't that right? We get filled up by his presence by his love, by his spirit, and we pour out in service and in outreach and in love towards other people. And so um, this is Missions Sunday, which is when we are reminded that it's not just about us. Praise God. Come on, look at somebody say, it's not just about you. Oh, man, as good as you look, it's not just about you. <laughs> but it's about those who Jesus is trying to reach through you and through us as a body. So we remind ourselves of that on each um, on each first Sunday of the month, on Mission Sunday. I know it's been uh, a little bit uh, unusual with us being outside and not in our normal environment, remembering and doing some of these things, but we do want to remember that uh, the reason that we are here to be filled up with God's presence is ordered so that we might have something to pour out and to give and to minister to other people. And so, uh, just again, as a reminder, uh, the seats where you are sitting in are literally on the parking lot where we were able to reach out to our community yesterday uh, for our Mercy Ministry Food Distribution uh, Day, and it was a tremendous day, I think. Uh, we gave out as more bags than we've given out on any other Saturday except for our Convoy of Hope uh, uh, earlier this summer. And so uh, many people are coming, and many regular people are coming. Uh, we're getting to know the names, and here's the good thing. As, uh, as I was speaking with some of our guests that were coming, and they were sitting in their cars waiting to, to receive their groceries on yesterday, uh, I was speaking to some of them, and... I ran into a few who had turned in prayer requests to the church family and said, Pastor, you remember I turned in a prayer request during our last, during our last time here? And I said, yes. We, I didn't always remember the, the face, but the names when they gave it to me because we pray for those in our prayer meeting. Um, we had some of those individuals say, Pastor, I want to tell you, my husband is doing better. My, my, my husband went to the surgery, and he's doing better. Please tell the church, thank you for praying. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Some of you that were in a prayer meeting, you remember there was another young lady. She was praying for uh, her, her, her entrance into college and school and getting her driver's license. And uh, she was behind the wheel. <laughs> she was behind the wheel. And she said, I passed my driver's license. So just listen, not only are we supplying physical food to meet, help meet the needs of families, but we are uh, getting out on the porch and being able to be a spiritual uh, bridge to these individuals to experience Jesus. And then, that's what it's about. Amen. We want other people to experience Jesus through us, through our body. So uh, this morning I've asked Sister Marcy just to, uh, to bring up the prayer requests from yesterday's uh, Mercy Ministry Food Distribution Day. And uh, we have several of them. And uh, I just want us as a congregation to join together and believe that God is going to answer these requests and meet these needs and show himself to these individuals that we have been able to give food for. So if, if you wouldn't mind, I know it's a, a little bit warm, uh, but you're in the shade, so it's all right. Come on, stand up with me one more time, and let's just pray for these needs that have uh, been turned into the church here this morning. Sister Marcy. Uh, 
Uh, the prayer request that we received, um, they're pretty much along the same lines as, um, pretty much the same line that uh, people are facing in general, health issues, job issues, finances, um, some children that are um, autism, autistic, well, they're home with their children now, so their yeah, problems are more magnified. So we're just gonna pray for, oh, and one person wrote, uh, please pray for um, COVID-19 uh, COVID to go away. <laughs> so we know that's on the mind of everybody. So we're just gonna pray. Father, we just thank you again, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that you are here. You cause us to be here in your presence among our brothers and our sisters. Lord, we know that there is no distance in prayer. Yes, we know that every prayer is, that's prayed, you hear them, Lord. Thank you, and we Jesus. thank you for your mercy and your grace. Yes, Lord. Lord. We just lay our hands in these prayer requests right now, Lord, person to person, each, each individual need that you are aware of, Lord, the unspoken as well as the spoken. Lord. So we thank you for the families, who, Lord, who are, who are meeting their needs through our food ministry. And Father, we thank you more than anything because you are causing those people to be alive and being able to listen. Father, we thank you for your mercy and yes, your mercy. grace. We ask you, Lord, Lord Jesus, your grace, to your continue love. to work with us, to continue to help us, Lord, to see the purpose of what it is that you're doing in our lives, Lord, whether it be big or small. We just thank you for each represented prayer, Lord, each represented person and family, Lord. We thank you, Father, because you know everything, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we put our trust and we put our, our faith in you. And, Lord, we pray by mercy, Lord, that you would sustain yes, each and every yes, family. Yes. Meet every need, Lord, presented in the name of Jesus. Yes. We know that you are at work in your church, Lord. We know that it is a purpose for the pandemic. We know this is not just a coincidence, Lord. We know what you already said that you've conquered yes, all, you Lord. Yes, and we have. stand on that. We pray yes, from that strength, Lord. Yes, God. We pray from that Do victorious the work, God. Do place. The work that you've already done everything Hallelujah. that needs to be done. You've Hallelujah. already overcome the world. Yes. And by being in you in Christ, Lord, we have already overcome the world as yes. well. Yes. And Lord, we thank you for each person. Lord, we pray for their salvation, Lord. More than even food in their yes, mouth, Lord, Lord, in their belly, we pray bring for their the salvation. Bring them to the knowledge. Bring them to the knowledge, Lord, of them Make yourself real you. in their lives. Lord, each one that they come through, Lord, that we pray we touch them in a special way. Yes. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We have hope, Lord. Yes. That Jesus Christ, yes. the fullness of the glory resides in you, Lord. Yes. And because you're in us, Lord, we can pray according to your will and your purpose. Yes, Lord. And in your time, Lord, that everything is revealed according to your plan and purpose. Lord, we know that Jeremiah 29 11, Lord, it says you know the plan, yes. the purpose that you have for each and every person yes. upon this earth. Lord, we know that those things will be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. We thank you, man, and we thank you, Lord, and praise your name. Praise your that matches the holy Glorious. name. That wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God. The one who took our place. Yes. The one who paid for each of yes. our yes. sins, Lord. It's in that one, that one that we're praying in and we're trusting, name. Lord. Yes. Because you said, Lord, that if we will, that they that know their God, mm. we will do great yes. exploits, yes, Lord. Yes, And Father, we thank you, Lord, thank for a soul Jesus. being saved. Thank you, That's God. great exploit. Yes, in the name Jesus. of Jesus. We thank you for each prayer request. We know that they answer, Lord, according to your time and purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining with us in prayer. Amen. I, and I do just want to kind of to add to that. If um, we have prayer meeting here outside on the patio every Friday evening at 7 p.m. Hey. Oh, come on. Come on. Now's a good time to warm up your amen button. Amen. Every Friday night, amen, at 7 p.m., right out of here on the patio, we have prayer meeting. Amen. And for those of you that uh, weren't here last Friday, I just need to let you know you missed out. You missed out. God was on the patio. Amen. God was on the patio. He moved out of the sanctuary and decided to reside on the patio this past Friday. And we had a wonderful time of just worship and just prayer and intercession and, then, and just being in God's presence. And so uh, I do want to just uh, encourage slash challenge you uh, that if... Uh, you have never been a part of the prayer meeting on Friday night at 7 p.m. We invite you to come out. Enjoy uh, God's presence. Enjoy interceding for the needs of God's people. And uh, I know that you will be blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
We want to turn our thoughts here to what God would say to us from his word for a few moments here this Sunday morning. Uh, I think we have all learned over the past of the week, during this past week, that it does not matter uh, what your educational level is. It does not matter what your or portfolio may say regarding your wealth. Uh, it doesn't matter what name you might carry as a part of your title or what how much power that you may have. Uh, none of those things can protect us from those things that all humans are vulnerable to. How I many you know what I'm talking about? Amen. One person knows what I'm talking about. Maybe I should be a little clearer. We found out this week that nobody is immune to the possibility of contracting a virus that all humanity is vulnerable to. How many understand what I'm talking about? Amen? Our position, our power, our wealth, our education, none of that can protect us from those things that all humans are vulnerable to in the physical world. And just as that is true regarding physical things, it is also true regarding emotional things and spiritual things, emotional struggles. It's been said that um, depression is like the common cold. Depression is like the common cold. <clears throat> At one time or another, everyone experiences it, experiences it on some level. Everybody experiences it on some level. Now, some, of, some people are affected very severe and they have, they have very uh, severe symptoms. Other people, the symptoms are mild. But someone no less than the great prince of preachers uh, Charles Spurgeon was an individual who, although he preached uh, to a congregation there at a Metropolitan Tabernacle in Chicago of 5,000 people on a weekly basis, he was a great orator, he was a great evangelist, he was a great pastor, but yet he struggled with bouts of darkness and depression. In fact, um, he once described his depression uh, with which he battled uh, by saying that there are dungeons beneath the castles of despair. He said there are dungeons that are beneath the castle of despair. And he used that imagery to describe the bout of depression that he had sometimes had gone through. And I'm not going to ask for a show of, can, show of hands, but I think all of us can identify on some level with how he felt. Jesus said, Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Isn't that what Jesus said? And if the New Testament letters or the epistles, uh, if they instruct us on how we are to love the Lord our God with all of our mind and helps us to develop godliness in our thoughts, it would be that Old Testament book of Psalms that I think instructs us on how we, we can love the Lord our God with all our heart or how we can develop godliness with how we handle our emotions. Because even as believers, we are not immune to the full range of emotions that are just a part of the human condition. Isn't that right? Come on, we experience joy and we experience the discouragement. We experience excitement and we experience lethargy and laziness. Come on, somebody, don't look at your neighbor. We experience all of those things as a part of being human. And just because we are believers does not mean that we are exempt or we are immune from any of those emotions. And so this morning I want us to turn to the Old Testament book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 42, or Psalm 42 actually. Because in this Psalm, we actually see uh, the writer of the Psalm. Many people believe it was David or maybe someone who was, uh, had access and was accustomed to being in the presence of God in, in, the, in the temple. And we see that even though they were uh, a godly person, even though they were someone that was uh, accustomed to being in the temple, that they had a fight, they had a battle with uh, discouragement and despair. Uh, we might as well just call it what it is, depression. They, they battled with that depression. And so Psalm 42 and 43, um, even though they are broken up in our, uh, in our English Bible, they're really uh, structurally and, and and thematically one psalm. So they're really to, to be viewed as one psalm. And so um, we're going to read this psalm, this collection here, uh, since we're at church. Come on. Nothing wrong with reading the Bible in church. Turn me up here. They can't hear me. There's nothing wrong with reading the Bible in church. Amen. Thank you for that word of confidence. <laughs> and so we're just going to read Psalm 42. It's not very long. With its 
uh, companion, which is Psalm 43. They're very brief. It says, begins with words that we're probably all very familiar with. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Verse 5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you discouraged and in despair and depression, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the mount of Mizra. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against the ungodly nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and wicked men. You are my God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy, the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the heart, O oh my God, O oh God, my God. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Amen. Praise God. I like those, those words there in Psalm 43 there in verse number 4 where he says, he says, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. To God my joy and my delight. Praise God. I'm going to talk this morning about the road to restored joy. The road to restored joy. And as we look at this combination of psalms, which is actually one psalm, I think it's pretty clear, if we're honest, that the psalmist was not in a place of joy throughout the entire journey. He mentioned several times several things that would indicate that he is going through a time of discouragement. He's going through a time of despair, and I would even say depression. One of the things that, that we, gives us that indication is that he has a whole lot of questions in this, in this psalm. There's a lot of questions. Anybody going through life and you find yourself where you have more questions than answers. Even though you know the Lord, even though you read his word, because of things you're facing, because of what you're feeling, because of things that are happening in your life and around you, you have more questions than answers. If you haven't, then you can borrow some of mine because I have. I've been to that place where I have more questions than answers. But looking at our psalmist, he has questions that, and, and, that, is, and that is coming from his own heart, that is coming from his own heart about his enemies who are ridiculing him. Questions that are coming from, from the enemy is that they're saying to him, where is your God? Verse 3, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? Verse 10, as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? He was dealing with questions that were coming from his opponents on the outside. Things of ridicule, comments of ridicule. But he was also dealing with questions in his own heart, where he was saying to his own soul, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so disturbed 
within me. And then he had some questions, can we just say it, that were directed to God. He had some questions that were not hurled at him from his enemies. They were not coming up from his own heart, but they were questions that he had for God. Because it says, it says in the scripture, it says, verse 9, Why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? And then chapter 43, verse 2, You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go on mourning oppressed by the enemy? And so these questions indicate or they reveal the struggle, they reveal the despair and the dismay that the psalmist was going through. Not only these questions reveal that, but also we see just his physical condition. It says in verse 3 that he had he was crying great tears. Verse 3 says he couldn't eat. His appetite was gone. Verse 5 says his countenance was falling. It was downcast. It, the, the downcast expression is what happens on the outside when the weight on the inside is too hairy, too heavy for us to carry. He was downcast in his countenance. He was experiencing the depression. And I do want to note that the thing that he was discouraged about is something that we need to take note of. He was discouraged because he had an absence of the sense of God's presence. He wasn't just discouraged because he didn't get what he wanted, because things were difficult. He was discouraged because he missed the presence of God. We don't know all the details surrounding, surrounding the historical situation, but we know enough to know this, that he was exiled. He was removed from the place where he could freely go to the temple and experience the presence of God in the place where he was manifest during the Old Testament era. And he missed being able to be in the presence of God. Can I just say for us, if we're going to be discouraged about anything, and there are some things to be discouraged about. The thing that ought to be on the top of the list is when we are not aware of the presence of God. More than anything else in our lives, we as believers need the presence of God. We need his presence. We need his presence to strengthen us through temptation. We need his presence to give us wisdom and direction when we don't know what to do. We need his presence to help us to do what we do know to do. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we need God's presence more than anything else in our life. And the psalmist valued the presence of God. He valued it just like a deer values water when being pursued by hunters. He recognized that it was, it was his life source. He recognized that it was the very key to the thirsting of his soul. And so he, ex he was experiencing that despair. He was experiencing that struggle. And so along with the, the picture that we see, of the struggle that he was going through, I think in some of these verses we can also see the road that he took to lead him back to that restored joy. Amen. To lead him back to the joy of God's presence. And so I just want to note those for us for, for a moment. To get back onto the road of restored joy when we're feeling that sense of despair or even depression, the first thing I think the psalmist teaches us is to confront the problem. To get back to the road to restore joy, the first thing we have to do is to confront the problem. Notice in verse 2, the psalmist said, my soul thirsts for you. My soul is thirsty. He acknowledged a soul thirst that he did not desire. He acknowledged there was something missing. There was an emptiness that he was missing the fullness of God's presence and satisfaction and joy that he was accustomed to and he acknowledged that problem. He said, my soul is thirsty, God. I'm missing something. And that soul thirst then produced a spiritual discouragement. We see it three times throughout this reading. Verse 5, he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? We see that in chapter 42 in verse 5. We see it in verse 11, and we see it again in Psalm 43, verse 5. And I just want to point out to us that the psalmist readily acknowledges his soul thirst. He readily acknowledges that he was downcast, he was discouraged, that he was, he was disturbed within him. He does not deny it, he does not ignore it, he does not pretend that it's not there, but he is quick to acknowledge that, to accept that, or to, to, to acknowledge that it's true. And just because he is acknowledging it, just because he does not ignore it, does not mean that he's approving of it. 
It doesn't mean, listen, that he's given in to it. He's just acknowledging it. And it is that acknowledgement that is the first step in preparing him to confront it. Come on, we know that that's necessary. You cannot resolve any problems that you deny. Isn't that right? <laughs> you cannot resolve problems that you deny. You have to first acknowledge it. You have to first recognize that there is something wrong. And we have a problem with denial. <laughs> it's kind of like that the child that has got into the cookie jar and they've got chocolate all over their face. It's all on their hands. <laughs> and their mom or dad approaches them and says, have you been in the, eating the cookies? And the, and the child looks back at the parent and says, no. But the evidence is what? All over their face. Sometimes we have problems that are all over our, our face. Come on, we have attitude problems, we got behavior problems, we got problems in our relationship with God, but yet we try to deny them, we try to ignore them, we try to go on as if everything is okay. But God would say to us, if we're going to overcome those areas of despair and discouragement and even depression, the first step to in confronting them is to acknowledge that we have that problem. Isn't that right? Praise God, sometimes we just need somebody else to tell us that we have the problem. To let us know, hey, I see chocolate on your face. I see something's wrong. I see the joy that used to be there is not present anymore. I see that your face is downcast. We have to acknowledge the problem. It might be that our love for God's word has begun to diminish. Maybe because of busyness, maybe because there have been disappointments, whatever it is. And we have allowed that to just creep into our lives where somebody else has to notice, hey, I don't recognize you talking about the Word of God as much as you used to do. Or I don't recognize praise on your lips the way it used to be there. How's, how's things going in your life? What's going on with your prayer life? We missed you, amen, for prayer meeting. Whatever it might be, maybe we don't have a passion to reach out to other people the way we once did. The first step in finding a road back to that restored joy of obedience is to confront the problem. And acknowledge it. Listen, there's nothing spiritual about acting like we have it all together. Isn't that right? That does not make us more spiritual. There's nothing spiritual about denying it. We have to acknowledge that there is an issue. The second thing that I see here from our text is that we're going to get back onto the road of restored joy. Not only do we have to confront the problem and acknowledge it, the second thing we have to do is, listen, consider the process. Consider the process. Again, looking back at our, at our psalmist here, his journey back to restore joy is not a one-time event. Instead, it is a progressive cycle that as we look at this reading, it repeats itself over and over again. I don't know if you caught it when we were, read, when we were reading it, but there is a cycle that is repeated at least three times, depending on how you break it up, at least three times throughout this reading of Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. He moves from lament or from sorrow into joy or to hope at least three times in this reading, depending on, like I said, how you break it up. And, it, and the mark or the indicator in each cycle, it's marked off by a repeated phrase. It's in 40, uh, verse 42, uh, Psalm 42, verse 5, verse 11, and then again in 43, verse 5. It's this. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? And then he says this. Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Three times. Three times the psalmist goes through that process. He goes through that progression of sorrow and discouragement and lament, but he ends up with joy and hope. Come on. Why three times? Because it always it doesn't always stick the first time. Come on, somebody. Sometimes when we come out of discouragement, we come, we overcome a fear, we overcome some anxiety, and we come out of it for the moment, and we begin to praise God for his salvation, we praise God for his deliverance. It's not long before those old circumstances pile back upon us, and we find ourselves back where we started. 
and we have to climb that mountain again. We've got to trust God again. We've got to begin to get into God's word. We've got to begin to speak and claim God's word. We've got to get into that place of prayer until once again we find ourselves out of the lament side of it and back on the hope and joy side of it. That says to me that it is a process. It was a process for the psalmist. And that's why we see this repeated refrain. We need to give consideration to that. That our joy and our restoration does not always come as a one-time event, but it is an ongoing process. Now listen, I, I know that if he wants to, if he wants to, God can always come in in one fell swoop. And he can remove any addiction, he can remove any depression, he can remove any uh, struggle, any attitude issue. He can do whatever he wants and do it all at once if he wants to. And at times he does that. Amen. Amen. At times he brings a breakthrough all at once and we celebrate that. We rejoice in that. But if you've been a Christian very long, you know that that's not the normal way he does it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we pray that we ask that, that somebody would just lay their hands on us and the problem would be gone. Come on, that we would no longer think that way. We would no longer act like, like that. Or that relationship issue would just so, suddenly resolve itself. We wish that that would happen, and sometimes it does. But more often, God chooses to work through the progression of a process. Step by step, little by little, over time. Praise God. Come on, that's not a lack of faith. Or it's not unspiritual to believe that. That's just how God frequently operates. He works through process. And we need to know that. We need to know that. Why? Because when we go through the, through the setbacks, we go through the times where we, we did it again, where we said it again, where that same problem came up between us again, and we have a setback to what we thought we had overcome in the past or the thing that was resolved. Listen, if we understand that it's a process, we won't say, well, I thought I was healed. Well, I thought I was cured. I thought it was all over. Instead of responding like that, we will say, no, this is just another part of the process. It's another step in me learning to trust God's word instead of what I see before me. And so I'm going to trust him once again. I'm going to aff affirm once again. Once again, as the psalmist says, I am going to put my hope in God and praise him as my savior. Praise him to be my deliverer. Amen. Amen. Don't be afraid of the process. It takes time. We know that in every area of life. It would be great if we could get the degree just by taking one test, right, and getting all the knowledge at one time. Those of you that are, that are in school or have been in school, but that's not how it works. What happens is you have to study one chapter at a time. You got to study a little bit this afternoon and then a little bit after dinner. And then tomorrow you got to study a little bit more instead of, instead of going out playing and socializing, you got to study a little bit more. You got to pull out those flashcards and start memorizing them a little bit again. It's a process, right? Isn't that true? Come on, it's, it's a process. It's a process, <laughs> Lord help us, when we're trying to get physically in shape. It would be nice if we could go to the gym one afternoon and work off all 35 pounds that we need to get rid of. <laughs> I'm not talking about you, I'm just talking about in gym. <laughs> to work off all of that excess weight just by one trip to the gym, but that's not how it works. You've got to do a little 30 minutes here, and then another 30 minutes on Wednesday, and then another 30 minutes on Friday, and then another walk on Saturday. It's a little bit at a time. Isn't that right? Why would we think in our spiritual life that our deliverance out of discouragement and despair and dismay and depression would be a one-time event? Listen, God says, no, I'm going to use a process. It's you trusting me today. It's you putting your hope in me today. It's you spending time in the Word today. And little by little, I'm going to release those bonds. Little by little, I'm going to restore the joy. Little by little. I'm going to make you aware of my presence all over again. It's a process. And we've got to consider that. We've got to understand that. Praise God. Praise God. To get on the road to restore joy, we have to confront the problem. Excuse me, I'm going to go through the process of fixing my mind. If I can. To the road, getting, getting back on the road to a restored joy involves confronting the problem and not denying it, not ignoring it, but acknowledging it. 
it involves considering it to be a process, not thinking it's going to be a one-time event, a one-time um, occasion where we're going to be delivered from it. And then lastly, I think it involves connecting to the person, connecting to the person really who is the restorer. As you go back and you look at Psalm, uh, Psalm 42 and, and, and 43 together, there are several mentions or several references to the person of God. It says in verse number one, my soul thirsts for God in general. And then he says, he calls him in a little more detail for the living God. He goes a little more descriptive in his reference to God. And then in verse number eight, he calls him the God of my life. Oh, he's more personal now. He's honing in on himself. And then in verse number nine, he says, he's God, my rock. And as I look at that progression, and I look at the references to God that the psalmist is making, it says to me that there is an increase in intimacy. There's an increase in understanding, an in increase in the personalness that in his relationship with God as he goes through the process of moving from sorrow and lament to hope and joy. The first example says, oh, he's just God. He's God in general. Oh, yeah, he is the living God. But then after he's gone through the cycle a little bit of affirming his hope in God, pretty soon he said he's not just God in general. He's not just the living God out there, but he is now what? He is the God of my life. I'm experiencing him. He is not just the rock of Israel. He is God, my rock. Amen. I'm learning how to stand on the solid ground of my relationship with him. And I just wonder if that's not one of the reasons why sometimes God allows us to go through times of depression or despair or discouragement is because he's trying to pull us a little closer. He's trying to let us know him on a deeper level than we've known him before. And so rather than just giving up and throwing up our hands, we can say, we can say, God, pull me a little closer to who you are. Help me to see you in a new light. Help me to know you on this level with these problems, with this circumstance. So it's not just, I heard what you did in their life. Yeah, I believe you can do it for them, but I know that you are doing it in me. Connect to the person. Any deliverance, any restoration in our lives involves connecting in relationship. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Come on. Many times we try to grow and we try to change and we try to be better people and we try to do it in isolation from other people. Why do we do that? I think we do it for many reasons, but one of them might be is because we do not want other people to see the weaker side of us. We don't want them to see the weaknesses of our heart. We don't want them to see the ugliness that we're having to battle through. Come on, not you, but the people at the, at the other church, right? <laughs> Come on, some of us, we have some weak areas. We have some things that are not so lovely, and we're trying to deal with them. We're trying to overcome them. We're trying to uh, start doing things that we know we should be doing better in or stop doing things that we know we should not be doing, but we're doing it in isolation. We're just saying, oh, it's just me and Jesus, me and Jesus, but he has not put us on earth to be me and Jesus. He's put us in the context of a church family. He's put us in the context of brothers and sisters. Amen. 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 And so any restoration, any growth, any deliverance, any spiritual freedom that we experience will not happen in isolation. It always takes place in connection and in community with relationship. Isn't that one of our core values at Grace? Come on, wave at me if you vaguely one time heard or saw on a flyer somewhere or core value that's related to that. <laughs> Come on. Our, our, our pursuing Christ likeness. Our pursuing Christ's likeness, our life phrase that's related to that says, I will commit to life change. I will commit to life change together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. That means I acknowledge I need your input. I acknowledge I need your prayers. I acknowledge you need my encouragement. Amen. We need one another. And if we are going to pursue Christ's likeness, if we're, if we're going to grow in sanctification and holiness, if we're going to experience more liberty and freedom in our spiritual lives, it's going to come in the context of connection with relationships. Come on, you don't get more spiritual going in your closet with your Bible. Go ahead. Come on. 
the hangers are not going to say things that you don't want to hear. Come on. Those, those coats are not going to get on your nerves. Those are the opportunities, come on, that God uses for us to grow, for us to mature, to connect with individuals for life change. First Thessalonians 5.11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Hebrews 4.13, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that you will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Romans 15 verse 14 says, instruct one another. Come on, we know the one another's of the New Testament. Encourage one another. Instruct one another. Comfort one another. Amen. Pray for one another. Bear the burdens of one another. So that road to restore joy, it involves connecting to people. But ultimately, it involves connecting to the person. The one who's working through people. That is our restorer. Amen. The one that the psalmist here calls my rock, my life, my savior. Come on, I believe that we can follow the example of our, our psalmist here. To come out of some of the despair, to come out of the discouragement, to come out of whatever the thing is that the enemy is trying to trip you up with right now. I think we can learn from the psalmist that we'll confront the problem, first of all, acknowledge it. We'll consider that it's a process and not hope for a, a one-time event, deliverance once, once at, a, at a moment, but be faithful to stick to the process. And if we will connect to people, specifically the person that is a part of our healing and restoration, I believe if we can do that, we'll find our way back on the road to joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, so much that you have not left us, Lord, to fend for ourselves, Lord God, but along with your word, along with the power of your Holy Spirit that indwells us, you have put us in connection and in community with one another. And Lord, each one of us is battling some struggle, some fear, some weakness, or some discouragement or depression, whatever it might be. Lord, I just pray that in those moments, God, you would settle our hearts that you would turn us towards those means of grace that you put in our lives with one another. That we would not be shocked or overwhelmed, Lord, when there are times of setback, but we would learn that there is a process that you are working out in us. And that we will trust you to complete that process. That we'll be faithful to you as we affirm our hope in you. Not in our own abilities, not in just trying to do better, Lord God, but our hope is in you, our God and our Savior. Connect us to one another. Let us find strength. Let us find encouragement. Lord, let us find instruction. Let us find challenge for one another so that we might live in the joy that you call us to live in. We thank you for the right now in Jesus' name. Just with every head bowed and every eye still closed, just I want to pray for those that are here this morning. Mr. the pastor. I've been going through some turmoil. I've been going through maybe even some discouragement, bordering on depression. And I just want to get back onto the road to joy in my life. I would acknowledge that before, before the Lord this morning and ask for prayer. Would that be you this morning? Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Let me put your hand down. God bless you. Father, you see these hands. You see the hearts, Lord, that are on the other end of that hand. And I just pray, Lord God, that whatever the discouragement has been, whatever the pain has been, God, whatever the battle has been, Lord, I pray that right now, Lord, that you would begin to put them on that road to restore joy, that road to freedom, Lord, to leave behind the accusations of the enemy, the taunts of the enemy. Lord, the, the accusation that God has left, God has abandoned, that God has forgotten. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them, Lord, those words of faith that I will yet praise him. You will be my Savior. You will be my hope. Lord God, and that as they do that, Lord, that you would just point them in the directions, Lord, of connecting with other people that will understand, that will support, that will pray with them, that will encourage them, Lord 
you know, hold him accountable. Lord, if you would point in a direction, Lord God, of, of not denying and running away from the problem, God, but being open and honest to bring it to you, knowing that you are a great deliverer. You are a restorer. You are a joy giver. Lord God, if you just bring about that process of renewed joy in their life. We thank you for right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for renewed joy in our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I believe that there's a process that God starts on Sunday, but it continues throughout the week. Amen? Amen. As we bring those things before God and we lay our hearts before him, he, begins, he continues to speak to us and to help us and to strengthen us. Amen. Well, we want to uh, also give opportunity this morning to, uh, to worship the Lord in giving. I want to remind all of those uh, that are here and even, and even those that are just watching on our, our, our Facebook page. Uh, I have to get used to saying that. <laughs> um, that you can give um, on our website, graceassembly.la. And just on the top right hand uh, tab on that page, there's a, there's a give online button. You can give there. If you'd like to do that, we greatly appreciate your support and continue to, to serve our community. And for those that are here, we do have the offering box uh, right over here by the sanitation table. And so we want to pray that God would just bless that offering box. Come on, we, we uh, it has been difficult for many people, and churches are not immune to the difficulties of, of things being uh, different during COVID. Uh, many of our, our church families not being able to gather, and so um, have not been able to give the way they give regularly. But God is our source, amen? I said, God is our source, amen? And so we, we, uh, we believe in to meet the need, and we know that he does that through people. So um, I'm going to pray that God would uh, bless our offering and bless the family those that are able to give this morning and you'll meet the needs uh, both of your family and of our church family. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have placed us here uh, on the corner of Wiley Post and Manchester in order to be a light, in order to represent you in a community where you want people to know your love and your grace. And Lord, we, we pray, God, that um, as your people give to support the work and the ministry that is going forward, that you would just open up storehouse of heaven upon every life, upon every giver, Lord God, that every uh, every tithe, every offering, Lord God, every free will gift, God, it would just be used for the, for the furtherance of your kingdom, for your glory, and God, that you would just, as that expression of love goes to you from, from these your people, that you would just meet every need, Lord God, of, of our faithful givers here this morning. Lord, every spiritual need, God, every financial need, Lord God, every relationship me, God, you show yourself to be the source of every good and perfect gift in our lives. So, Lord, we just again, offer this uh, offer to you. Pray, God, that you would just uh, be glorified in the heart and the attitude of the giver. Lord God, that you would just bless every